Welcome to this week's edition of Ask an MS Expert. I'm John Strum, and I'm the host of the Real Talk MS podcast. Each week, Real Talk MS reaches thousands of people in more than 90 countries around the world with the news that people affected by MS need to know. My wife, Jean, lived with progressive MS for 23 years, so I've had a front row seat experiencing all the ways that MS can impact a family. Currently, I'm a member of the International Progressive MS Alliance Scientific Steering Committee. I'm a district activist leader and trustee for the National MS Society, and I chair the Society's California Government Relations Advisory Committee. Thank you to all of you who are joining us today on GoToWebinar, Facebook Live, and YouTube Live. The MS Society's Ask an MS Expert webcast is designed to connect you with MS experts who are ready to answer your questions on the topics that impact people affected by MS every day. So as I chat with our expert today, please feel free to post your questions on Facebook and YouTube, or type them into the question box if you're joining us on GoToWebinar. We'll try to answer as many of your questions as we can during the Q&A portion of today's program. As you age, the way you manage your MS symptoms changes. And that means adopting new habits, new routines, and a different mindset. Today, we're talking about coping with MS and age-related changes. We'll dive into age-specific preventive health measures, managing other chronic health conditions, cognitive and emotional changes, hormonal changes, and of course, your questions. Joining us as our expert is Dr. Jaime Imitola. Dr. Imitola is the director of the Division of Multiple Sclerosis and Translational Neuroimmunology at UConn Health. He's a board certified neurologist with clinical expertise in aggressive and progressive multiple sclerosis, late onset multiple sclerosis, and neuromyelitis optica spectrum disorder. Dr. Imitola brings to today's conversation over 20 years of experience focused on progressive MS, along with expertise in the design, execution, and oversight of translational research trials for multiple sclerosis and spasticity. Welcome and thank you for joining us today, Dr. Imutola. Okay, one second. All right. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much for the kind invitation. And um, I'm very pleased and uh, humble for you know, the opportunity to share um, our expertise in aging uh, with MS. Now let's talk about aging with MS. With more effective treatments for MS, people living with MS can expect to live well into old age. And with increasing numbers of older adults with MS, it's important for healthcare providers to be attentive to the relationship between multiple sclerosis and normal age-related changes. Dr. Imitola, we know following general preventative health measures is just as important for those people living with MS as it is for all of us. What are examples of, of common preventative health care measures that people should keep in mind? Yeah, so this is a great question and, and it's important to me. I am I'm interested in aging and we here develop a program of MS and aging uh, together with the Yukon uh, Center for Aging. So what we do is try to collaborate and identify areas that are needed for healthy aging. Um, we um, say that instead of, you know, just age, you need to add life to your years. And um, in terms of the specific questions, well, uh, there are several things that, that are needed. Um, one is to get an idea of what is the status of your overall health. And the, the way we do that is actually by doing uh, preventive measures that are related to uh, diagnosing uh, or anticipating issues that can happen as you age. For instance, uh, cancer. I mean, you, we know that there are some recommendations about um, uh, blood or cold blood in the stool. That's an important consideration when and how to do a, a colonoscopy. That's an important issue. Um, we think that uh, things like hearing and, and analysis of your hearing is important after age 50 
Um, one that is very important for, for us in MS is the issue of bond density, because we have uh, the experience uh, of patients that you know, have been in medications like prednisone or uh, long-term steroids or other medications and the issue of falls in MS. So we, we know and we, we would like to uh, perhaps suggest that patients over the age of 55 uh, they periodically, um, you know, go and and get this evaluation. Now, the the way we do that is that we work together with the primary care doctor. So this is an important thing. If you are a patient with MS that are that is age 55 or older, I mean, everybody needs a, a great primary care doctor, but especially uh, MS patients. So we can actually um, work collaboratively and cooperatively to see what areas require more, more work. Remember one thing that is important. MS is not one, just uh, one thing. MS, uh, MS depends of the patients. I, I always tell patients, you know, MS patients are like flowers. You know one way you see them, but they are all different. So the same happens in, in your disease trajectory. I like to talk about trajectories and the amount of dis disability and uh, the uh, amount of burden. So, all of those um, important concepts are going to be um, evaluated at the moment where we consider uh, the aging process in MS. So I think that we need to have an idea of how is the status of the overall health of the patient. And, and we do that by preventative measure, meaning we need to investigate how are things, and that's the regular um, uh, health checkup, and also how the MS is going on, what, what's going on with the MS, what is the burden of disease, what is the burden of symptoms. Are there specific recommendations for men and then different specific recommendations for women? Yeah, and, and that's a very important question. When, when you get a certain age, there is a dichotomy or a separation of what we call comorbidities. Comorbidities are basically other diseases that happens in, in, in people, in regular people, like hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular diseases. In women, um, there is a lot of depression, anxiety. Um, there are hormonal changes that are very important and they can compound and they can worsen the symptoms of MS. In contrast, uh, in uh, patients, in, in male patients, you have the urology issues, you have also the cardiovascular issue, and the, the risk of a stroke and diabetes. And that can really, really impair the long-term um, trajectory of the patient. Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought up comorbidities um, co or, or coexisting health conditions that may be separate from MS, but may somehow still be affecting a patient. Um, what, what are some chronic health conditions that someone may experience as they get older? Well, um, there are several, as I said, hypertension, diabetes, um, these are very important, osteoporosis, and the, the risk of falling or the inability to, uh, to be, uh, you know, to have a normal gait, that's something that happens uh, in normal aging. And, and it's uh, worsen if you have a mess, and obviously if you have a mess that affects some of the areas that has to do with with your gait, uh, either in the spinal cord lesions or uh, lesions in the brainstem. So these are these are very important um, components to to evaluating every patient, especially the issue of falling. And in addition, the issue of stroke. I mean, because we know that you age, you you enter 50, 65 years old, we can see that. And uh, one of the important issues that we need to discuss is the issue of the smoking. Uh, smoking is is associated with um, actually accelerating aging, you know, at the level of the cells. Um, it actually triggers uh, more activity of the immune cells, and we know that a, the smoking worsens the um, cognitive decline, worsens the amount of lesions in MS, and makes the disease actually get really really bad quickly. Many of your, our viewers are wondering how they can tell if they're experiencing an MS symptom or an age-related change. What kinds of things should they look for? Yeah, this is a great question. And I, I think that um, 
as a an intro, quick introduction, I will tell all our viewers and listeners that you know you need to know your disease a little bit better. I mean, I know that we have the the um, interest, and we go to Wikipedia, we go to to Google, and we kind of get uh, in a sense of what we, we try to get a sense of what happens to us based on what we what we read. But the the best um, teaching tool is actually your MS doctor. You need to ask questions. You need to know exactly what happens. So in this regard, there are several important things. One is, okay, so what is a relapse? What is the expectation of a symptom of MS that can be there? Uh, for instance, um, if you had a optic neuritis and uh, you get exposed to the sun or you take a hot shower or you're tired at the end of the day, you may have some uh, you know, symptoms coming back not to, not to the same extent, but then you you have them, and then you know usually you call me and say, well, you know, I I'm a, I'm a flaring up, and I say, okay, so what happened? So uh, you can have a UTI. UTIs are also important, especially in patients with a spinal cord lesions. UTI stands for urinary tract infection. So if you have a urinary tract infection and you have symptoms of uh, pain or numbness or tingling, that is not a relapse. That's not an MS relapse, it's, we call it pseudo relapse. It's important though, but it's a, you know, knowing these things can make it different in the level of anxiety and depression of the patient. Now, um, things that happens in normal aging, as I mentioned to you, the lack of, um, you know, um, clumsiness can happen as, a, as, a, as an issue uh, associated with gait instability. Um, the issue of uh, um, having some troubles uh, multitasking, depending on the age of the patient. Many, many patients, when they get to older, you know, 70s, 80 years old, you can have a little bit of that. Um, and also the issue of mood changes. And depending of, of whether or not, I mean, depending on what your, what we call premorbid personality, I mean, depending on who you are, what kind of person you are. If you're anxious or you are uh, a person that is, um, you know, calmer, you can have the evolution of worsening symptoms uh, depression is very important as you get older because you know you you are you can get uh, lonely. You, I mean, your spouse may be with you, may may not be with you. Maybe your kids are with you. So all of those things are important to anticipate uh, the needs of that patient. And and by the way, it's not bad to feel bad because you are alone. And the the point is that you know at your age uh, there are ways to compensate and there are ways to improve the sense of loneliness and that is uh, appreciated in many patients. You know, while we're talking about things that people can do, um, routine vaccines, aside from the COVID vaccine, but routine vaccines are part of general preventative health measures. But some people with MS have concerns about the safety of vaccines in general. What are the recommendations about routine vaccines for people living with MS? Yeah, the, the recommendations are as follows. I mean, we don't encourage a live vaccinations. These are rare um, occurrences. Uh, the most important vaccinations that we were dealing in a daily basis are the flu vaccine, uh, the, um, the um, varicella vaccine. Uh, and these are vaccines that you can you can actually have. I mean, you can you have to organize with your MS provider. I mean, you have to um, to know the timing of the medications, but uh, the flu vaccine, for instance, is a vaccine that, uh, the, there are several, but the one that we use, the quadrivalent, uh, the shot, you know, that's the, that's the most uh, common name, um, is quite okay in MS. Now, the issue of, of uh, side effects, yes, there are, uh, many occasions where people uh, associate vaccinations with um, potential side effects, but in reality, the studies may, uh, that we have done over the years, uh, these are rare, very rare occasions. So uh, we think that it's important to get your your flu vaccine, and if you are uh, to if you are to if you need to start a medication for MS uh, that requires a, a, a number of vaccines. Uh, we recommend that those vaccines are done prior to the initiation of your medications. Let's talk a little bit about using disease-modifying therapies as people with MS age. T to begin with, 
how does the immune system change as someone ages? Yeah, this is a great question. We have a name for that. We, we call it immunoaging or immunosenescence. And the reality is that certain areas of the immune system uh, decrease their ability to fight diseases or even uh, to start an autoimmune process. We remember that uh, MS is more frequent between uh, 18 and 40. And I mean, it's very rare to find people with MS later on. However, there are some other um, branches of the immune system that gets a little bit more prickly, more active. And those are the ones that we, we tend to be a little bit concerned. I mean, there is a, a branch of the immune system we call innate immunity, macrophages, monocytes, and microvia, that they respond, they, they tend to over respond to, to things. And, uh, and that's why, you know, in the case of flu, sometimes you get patients that they, they uh, when, when they were 30s, they got a flu and, you know, they were okay. But when you become like 60, you get a huge pneumonia, you get a lot of, uh, you know, a huge infection, and then you, you can get from infection to uh, an overwhelming infection, and then you, you, you may have a, a fatality. So the, the immune system is very tricky because there are portions that are decreased as you age, but there are other portions that get more activated and, and that can be a little bit um, you know, dangerous in certain occasions. If someone's MS has been stable for years, can they age out of taking disease-modifying therapies? Yeah, this is a, um, a million-dollar question, and this is very important. Uh, um, our colleague, Dr. Corroy from Colorado, is actually leading a, a big, big study that is called discontinuation of MS uh, medications in patients uh, that are older. And, and, and there are two ways to answer this question. I mean, the, the, the studies that are done are very limited, very um, not powered. And we know that if you stop NMS medication, there is a possibility from 15% to 40% that the disease comes back. And obviously that depends on your prior burden of disease. Let me explain. If you had bad MS before, when I talk about bad MS, I'm talking about big lesions, a lot of burden, a lot of relapse. If you stop the medication, it's very likely that that come back and that can create a lot of disability. Remember that our goal is to prevent disability progression. Um, but in many cases, like you pointed out, many I have a lot of people and that are more than 65 and uh, they say, well, you know, I." I've been stable, my MRI is stable. Can I get out of the medications? Well, I mean, this, this is something that is a shared decision process between me, the MS doctor, and the patient. And I said, you know, if you're interested, perhaps that would be a good idea because listen, this is the evidence that we have. You know, your disease has been stable for more than five years in the MRI and the, also the, the actual uh, symptoms. There is no relapse, but there is a caveat. The caveat is that this disease can come back. So we need to we need to be honest and open this. And many patients say, you know, I don't want to stop it. Um, I want to continue. Or, or some patients say, well, you know, I need to stop it because it's costing me fifty thousand dollars a year, and um, I I don't have um, uh, that that kind of money, etc. So the idea, the, the at the end of the day, the reality of this is that we are actually trying to answer that question. Um, um, in terms of a prospective, well-funded, um, with a lot of patients, um, uh, clinical trial that is actually ongoing at this moment. So at the end of the day, I'm not advocating uh, anyone that is listening that you can say, well, I, 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 can't, I don't want to take more my medication. It's an individual decision, and it's an individual decision that you have to uh, do with your MS doctor. And that has to be clear. That's what, when we start your medication, we go into a shared decision process. And if we're going to stop you or change you, we go into the same decision process. So it's, it's, a, it's a team effort. MS can cause variable symptoms, and so can aging. We know cognitive and emotional changes are common in MS, but I think you've pointed out they can also, those things also decline due to aging. 
So first, what are some cognitive changes a person may experience as a symptom of MS? This is a great question. I get that question a lot in all my patients that are more than 60. And, and the issue depends. I think it's important to say here, and it's important to teach the, the, your, my patients about what I call the burden, the burden of disease. There are, there are um, um, symptoms that are, are seen that you can see uh, that are there, and there are others that you can see for the depression anxiety, so important, right? And you, as a, as a patient, you can be depressed and that influences your cognition. But when I see the MRI, the MRI is completely okay. In contrast, there are many patients where their brains are affected. There is a lot of atrophy. There is a lot of lesions. And those patients may have um, a lot of ready of uh, alterations in cognition. So uh, the doctor, your doctor will make an assessment of these uh, invisible symptoms and these uh, visible changes in your MRI. So I think it's important to, for you to know that. I mean, that that's very important. Um, um, I, don't wanna, uh, I don't want you to get the idea that, that anything that happens in your life is because of MS. You, know, you can have depression for other reasons. Um, uh, it is true that 50% of patients with MS will experience depression at some point. But the, the answer it depends on your burden. So I always talk about the burden of lesions and the burden of symptoms as a, an important component of how you need to know about your disease. So it, it sounds as though cognitive changes may occur as a symptom of MS. They may also, or, or instead of that, occur uh, simply as someone ages. And the same is true with some of these emotional changes like depression, how can people living with MS best adjust to these cognitive and emotional changes as they age? Yeah, and, and, and before we go there, I mean, one, one thing that is important to note is this, uh, the, the most, the, there is something that I teach patients is that many patients with MS said to me, oh, you know, I cannot do my job, I cannot concentrate, I, I forget this and that. And I ask the question, is your family members worry about you? Usually when you worry, when you start saying that there are some of the symptoms, probably it's lack of attention or fatigue that actually is very important for decreasing the ability for you to focus, right? But if the family member is saying, oh, John, what's going on with you? You know, you, you used to do this and now you can. Uh, and then you say, no, I'm, I'm, I'm fine, I'm fine. You know, John, I mean, we caught you uh, 3 a.m. in the morning in the garage, what were you doing? And he, you go, no, I, I'm okay. Well, those, when the family members start to worry, that's when you know that there is something there that is important. So how do you adjust? Again, we go back to the, the question. You need to have an assessment. Sometimes the assessment will require uh, a, a battery of tests, including a neuropsychological assessment to, to actually uh, parse what is what? I mean, sometimes I have patients that are very depressed and they cannot function. So you, you, you tackle the depression and they get better. And I have patients that are, that they, they have tons of lesions and we can, there are some strategies there that we can, that we can work on and they get better. So the compensation is established uh, specifically after a lengthy evaluation that sometimes is needed because you, you wanna compensate. The question for many patients or the, or the point for many patients is how do you get there? How do you avoid that? Well, you avoid that by you know, increasing your fund of knowledge, reading as much as you can, um, having a healthy diet, um, not smoking, and following the recommendations uh, as your age uh, that, that are required. Hypertension, people with hypertension uh, will have burden of, of hypertensive disease in the brain, and that is also associated with cognition. You know, MS is three times more common in women than men. So let's talk about hormonal changes and menopause, as these are both a, a natural part of the aging process. Um, can hormonal changes affect MS symptoms? Oh, yes. Um, and this is very important, as I mentioned to you before. Um, I usually, when I see patients that are 
order than 50 um, coming for the first time to see me and get an idea of what the problems are. There are many issues, right? And the hormonal changes, especially the postmenopausal or premenopausal symptoms are very relevant. They can, and there are very good um, studies done in, in around the world uh, and from Spain to the United States, where we know that uh, hormonal changes, especially um, with the estrogens can alter the, the symptoms and can, can get worse. In addition, uh, hormonal changes can uh, reduce um, uh, the level of estrogens that can lead to urology or um, sexual alterations. And uh, so that, that's an important thing. So many women will complain um, that there is um, uh, changes in her um, in intimacy with the, with the partners because there is no lubrication and there is pain. And that's, a, that's a part of the whole package. And this is part of the things that we need to address uh, with patients. And yeah. Do you recommend that women with MS use hormone replacement therapy during menopause? Yes, yeah, so the answer to that is, is partially yes. And again, um, what I don't work uh, on, on this particular question myself, I have to work with our team of endocrinologists that they, they do this all the time. I mean, as an MS doctor, I'm leading the, the comprehensive care of a patient, but based on the literature, based on the reports, and the studies at this moment, um, we think that that can help, uh, provided that the endocrinologist is okay with that. Uh, however, we need more studies to uh, completely confirm the effect efficacy. The, the one of the limitations of the studies is that they are very small and limited. But I think that um, uh, every every person that is going to the to menopause has to uh, you know have a assessment. Uh, within the clinologies, and if there is no contraindication from them, perhaps that person can, can start. As our bodies age, we see differences in physical functioning. Many older adults, including those with MS, want to stay as independent as possible. Uh, so is it safe for older adults living with MS to stay active? Oh yeah, that's a great question. Um, um, one thing that every patient needs to know, again, and I go back to this question of your individual trajectory. You need to know what is your MS, not the, not the neighbor's MS. And so the idea is that everybody needs to have a plan for physical therapy. Many patients will say to me, well, I'm okay, I can't walk. Well, that's okay. Um, the, uh, one of the biggest issues in, in this is the falling and the gait instability. That's a significant problem with MS patients. And um, we need to ask patients to be active and stay engaged, but that according to the level of disability, there are things that can be done. For instance, what is the goal of PT in many patients? You can see it. I mean, some patients will tell me, well, I, you know, I have right leg weakness. Why should I get physical therapy again? And, and the patient can walk, but he walks you know, with certain um, instability in the right leg, I say, you know, if you don't do anything, if you stayed in your chair or you just stay watching TV, the muscle of, of that right leg is gonna decrease. That has a name, it's called sarcopenia. And once you lose the muscle, you're not gonna have muscle to contract. Therefore, the idea is to maintain a certain level of exercise and here's where we work closely with physical therapy here. So there are three goals, clearance, endurance, and safety. Clearance, endurance, and safety. So every patient with MS that walks funny, that he's a, what we call furniture walker, that, that he stumble, there, there is, the, the, the number of falls acceptable in MS is zero. You cannot fall. I have, a lot of experience in people that, you know, they are a little bit stubborn and they, they don't use the walker, they don't use the cane. I have people walking through windows, uh, walking through glass doors. I have people falling in basements, having uh, bleeds in the head. 
because you know they don't heed the word. So I think that it's important that uh, there is a certain level of engagement. Obviously, the the more disabled or the more disability you have, there there will be a change there. But every patient has to have a plan for uh, physical activity. Now, finally, you can say, well, I'm in the wheelchair. What am I going to do? Well, you know this. If you can use your hands, boy, you can do a lot with your hands. So, I mean, upper extremity function is important, not only for you, it's a target of care. It's a target of, of, of uh, our goal of care for MS patients. So how can someone recognize when they need assistance? When is it time to ask for help? Yeah, I think that uh, in my experience and based on the experience of, of others and in, in the work that is being published, as soon as there is, uh, you know, continued dizziness, uh, uh, gait instability, meaning that you cannot stand or you cannot uh, uh, walk for a certain period of, of distance, when you have troubles getting out of the bathroom and you have near falls, near falls are actually a very important predictor of falling. And I can tell you that please, uh, if, if, if you have near falls, um, you're just one fall away from breaking something, as I call it, important. You, you break your hip, it's gonna be very, very disturbing because your life is gonna be up, uh, you know, upside down. And if you break your hip and you cannot walk before, well, it's gonna be very tough going uh, after. So the, there's, if, if there's anything that you can get from today's is that you need to be active, proactive, participatory, and engaging in your own physical therapy approach so you uh, can actually improve your, your risk of falling. Well, speaking of being active and proactive, planning for future needs as you age with MS is one way to feel more in control. How can a person's neurologist or MS specialist help them plan for their potential needs as they age? Yeah, there are several, this is an important issue and, and we have here, um, you know, uh, we have patients that are um, more than 70. I have patients that are 75, um, some of which are, they are not in any medications and we, we do what we call symptomatic therapy. And um, those are, um, this, this plan depends on the goals. What are the goals? And also, what is the level of uh, uh, disability that you have? Many patients will be in wheelchairs, um, and there are levels of discussions, you know, like a, a power of attorney, conservatorship, et cetera. So uh, there, depending on what the level of disease uh, you have, we have to have several kinds of discussion. But this is important in the planning phase, uh, especially when, when you are engaged in, in this discussion that we call the, the first uh, visit of a patient that is more than 65 and having MS. Yes, uh, we have here, or I mean, there are many places also that, that uh, we can engage our social workers with a lot of experience um, in, in care for patients. We can um, facilitate um, home visits um, of nurses, uh, there are many uh, hurdles that the patient might present, uh, you know, uh, keeping uh, track of medications, um, keeping track of appointments. And now with telemedicine, that actually helps a great deal because, um, you know, if you are stable and, uh, you know, one of the things that happens in, in COVID-19 is that many patients just remain at home, you know, they're hiding you know, at home. So I said, you know, keep, 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 keep there. That's fine, you're stable. We can talk all you want and I can see you, you know, that you're fine, but there are other patients that, that cannot do that, that they need the help. Yes, so the point is that at the end is that depending on the level of disability, what are your values as patient, then you can make a plan. And that plan may be uh, with yourself or you can have a, someone that, uh, that is your power of attorney or, or someone that can help or family members and, and, and it needs to be discussed. And there are other considerations, especially when you are a patient that is quadriplegic and uh, you don't, you cannot move any arms or legs and you cannot talk. These are rare occasions, but you know, this, we have, we have patients like that here. We can, we manage those patients and we, we give them the same attention that any other person that walks in that can talk. 
you know, talking with uh, family or partners and friends about what the future may have in store can often be stressful and, and a real source of worry. What's a good way to start these conversations? Um, yes, this is a you know very important question. I, I, I'm very happy that you bring this up. That conversation is started well when you're diagnosed. Obviously, uh, our attitudes toward MS has changed from you know uh, diagnosed and adios 30 years ago to well we can do something. Right now, we are very empowered as a scientists and clinicians to start early to, to really go after the disease and make sure that primary and secondary prevention measures are in place. So the discussion about the disease process is start at that moment. So the, the uh, it, you know, at some point um, during the visits, perhaps will be important to include a family member that is gonna be responsible for that patient. Uh, and this, the discussion will depend obviously on the level of disability of the patient uh, as I said, or the level of, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I see patients with that they have so progressive uh, and um, very severe disease that they cannot interact with anyone. And so they have power of attorney. So the idea is to start in the beginning uh, or at, at a level where there is a, a notion that there is some progression of the disease if there is progression, remember, Right now, with our medications, we think that starting early, being aggressive, having all these discussions and knowing about your disease can change your trajectory. You know, there are so many things to plan for as someone ages with MS, like um, home accessibility, finances, home care or long-term care, and even end-of-life directives. How does someone start? planning for all this yeah well the, i mean we we in general we had to include our social workers with a lot of experience in the field and uh, there are now uh programs we have here a palliative care um, um nurse practitioner that can help us when that uh, conversation happens and but as a as as you realize that you're getting into the 60s you know, these are conversations, uh, especially the conversation of, of how is my health? And then if your health is poor, then you go to the next level. Now, obviously for someone that is very sick, the realization of this conversation can come organically, naturally. I mean, he can say, you know, it's good. It's just, we need to have a plan or wife or kids um, uh, in a very uh, small um, a family uh, visit or family uh, meeting, they can discuss all these issues. I mean, I had the uh, fortunate situations where I need to talk to a family about a patient, especially in the inpatient service. And, and then we, we gather together, right? we explain and we listen to what they have to say, what the values are, so we can make the next step, the next plan. But yeah, that's an important discussion to have as soon as we appreciate that there is a direction that married that conversation. Well, you've shared a lot of really important information about a topic that more and more people are starting to think about and talk about. What would you say are the top takeaways that you'd like our audience to remember? Yeah, so I, I, I think that, you know, over the last 15 years, I have dedicated uh, a lot of effort to close gaps in MS. And there is a huge gap in what I call personalized education. In, in this specific uh, 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 topic, patients, um, and he's actually here in this, um, in this slides, you, you need to be ready for an appointment. You need to, to actually take the best out of the appointment, get ready and be ready with questions. So I think that the three main issues I'll we'll take away right now or four will be, um, please keep a diary of your symptoms. Think about the symptoms as a burden. I mean, there is an accumulation of symptoms. You need to get a tally. You need to know, uh, uh, you know, what time, what frequency. Um, be, be ready to discuss that. You know, you come to my clinic or any MS center because of the symptoms, uh, the majority of the time. The second is, it is important for patients to understand 
what is going on with your brain? It's like your garden, you know, you, you want to keep your, or the backyard, you know, beautiful and healthy. Well, you need to know what your spine and your brain looks like. I mean, your lesions, uh, the frequency, where are they, whether they have uh, this, the so-called T1 black hole, et cetera. Do you have new lesions? Are they enhancing? This is important because many doctors, you know, not all of you go to an MS center. Many, many of you go to um, local neurologists and, and many local neurologists will say, well, you have a lesion that is new, but let's see, let's wait and see what, what happened with that. Well, guess what? If you have a new lesion and your doctor doesn't change medications, well, you know, that's not what we want. That's not what the American Academy of Neurology suggested. That's not what the MS Society suggests. We need to, we need to actually um, anticipate more disease. The, the third point that is important is, is actually what are your risk factors for progression? And we have now a lot of information, great deal about things that may be very relevant for progression. The smoking, um, vitamin D deficiency, diet, you know, uh, a diet that is not gonna help you, uh, a diet that will um, produce you to have hypertension. That's, uh, that's another important thing. So you need to know that. And finally, is this concept of healing or resilience, you know, um, it, we need to empower the patients to try to go back to a resemble of a great life. I mean, you're not a fault that you have MS, but we want to make sure that your uh, goals and your aspirations are met. And in order to do that, you need to appreciate and forgive yourself and go forward with something called resilient and healing. Healing is this, um, this, you know, reacquiring this sense of wholeness. I know sometimes it's difficult because you say, I cannot see well, but you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a glass um, uh, full kind of guy, half full rather than half empty. So I, I take you as you come. I mean, I always tell patients, listen, this is life and you're about here. My job is to steer you this way. And whatever your goals are, Let's work together. Let's 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 uh, find uh, ways to help you. But you need to help yourself, and sometimes it's difficult because patients um, they feel shocked. And by the way, one of the most important things uh, is not in the the other side. It's when you get diagnosed. I think that patients, when they get diagnosed, they get sick of the diagnosis. You, you there is a a powerful statement about having a, a chronic disease like a man. So. We want to take that stigma out. You know, we want to fight, and that's what we do. So these are the four uh, areas that I think that you need to be ready, and you need you can actually copy that and take it to your next visit and say, my doctor said that. You know, let's let's see what you know whether you know about this. If you, as a patient, uh, um, you're empowered, we we have half of the battle. You know, uh, won here in MS. Well, I think that that is some excellent advice. I think we have time for one more question from, from our audience today. And actually it's a family member of someone living with MS. Megan says her dad's been living with MS for 20 years and she's wondering what is the best way to support her dad as he ages? Yeah, this is a great question. And again, um, we're talking from the perspective of a family member. And you know we talk always about MS as a one person's disease, but in reality it's not. I mean the the, the disease affects everyone, and there is uh, different perspectives. I mean my mom was sick at a time, you know, even for a doctor. Like I mean I'm a doctor, and when, when my mom was sick, I was like, wow, I was shocked to know that this is impactful to me. So I think that it's important to attend to her needs and expectations, and that's what you know, family uh, member visits or um, um, follow-ups are important. And, and the, the way that I will say um, uh, to this person uh, how to help and prepare <clears throat> is actually know in what capacity you can, can you help. You know, are you living with him? Are you living close to him? Are you, uh, how old is the, the, the patient? Uh, what are the immediate needs? Uh, safety is a very important thing, considerations of, uh, comorbidities, uh, complications. So there is a laundry list that they, that um, can be um, um, analyzed, uh, and that's why there is always there is a combination, and that's what I 
I support uh, for all patients is that you get a, a you get seen by an MS uh, neurologist that is the leader of a team, and you have a great primary care doctor that is interested in, in taking care of all patients or older patients. And with that, you make a team for that particular patient. Well, I want to thank all of you who submitted your questions. And thank you, Dr. Imitola, for being with us today. I think that one of the best things that anyone can do for themselves, especially during these uncertain times, is to make sure that the information they're getting is credible and reliable. So we'd like to share some resources with you. And these are resources that you can count on to be current and credible. First, I want to remind you that the National MS Society's MS Navigator Team is your best partner when it comes to connecting you to the very best information and resources on living with MS. And you can reach an MS Navigator by phone, email, or through the Society's website by chat. And please visit the National MS Society's website to learn more about COVID-19 and MS, and you'll find great resources to help you live well with MS as you age. We also know that these are particularly difficult times for so many people, and I wanna make sure that you're aware that the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They offer free and confidential support for people in distress, as well as suicide prevention and crisis resources for you or your loved ones. You can reach them by calling 1-800-273-8255. Every week on Real Talk MS, I continue the conversation that we start here. So I hope you'll take a few minutes and give Real Talk MS a listen. You'll find Real Talk MS at realtalkms.com, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, or wherever you find your favorite podcasts. You can connect with the National MS Society along with others affected by MS on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. I encourage you to like, subscribe, and make sure that you're on the Society's mailing list so you'll continue to receive the latest information on MS, COVID-19 vaccines, and of course, updates on upcoming programs just like this one. I'd like to thank Dr. Jaime Imitola for joining us today. And I'd like to thank everyone who's joined us for your great questions. Please remember that a recording of this webinar is going to be available on the Society's website at nationalmssociety.org slash msexpert. It will also be available on Facebook and YouTube. I hope you'll join us for next Friday's edition of Ask an MS Expert, when we'll be talking with Dr. Linda Mona about sex and the different ways that MS can affect sexual feelings and functions. Now I have a favor to ask each of you. Getting your feedback on today's webinar is important. So you'll see a survey pop up in a moment when we close out the webinar. And if you're watching on Facebook Live, you'll see that survey pinned to the comments section. And on YouTube, you'll find that link in the program description. Completing the survey makes a real difference. The information you provide helps us continuously improve and it helps shape future programs. The survey takes just one minute, so I hope you'll take a minute and please fill it out. On behalf of Dr. Jaime Imitola and the National MS Society, I want to thank you once again for joining us. Please stay safe and make healthy choices.